Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Samuel! Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are continuing our journey through the Gospels. This is Gospels Part 103. Last week we continued Jesus' entrance into the Holy City uh, during the final week of his life. Um, And in the previous week we saw where he had sent two disciples to go find a colt, a donkey, um, in, in need of the Lord's service for Jesus. And we picked up from there where the disciples found it just as Jesus had described it. And he sits on it and goes into the city, and you have this majestic, exciting, overwhelming picture of hordes of people uh, viewing this spectacle of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. Um, They're laying down cloaks, palm branches, saying, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the Son of David, all of these messianic images coming yeah. together. And like always with Jesus' life, you have those that are in opposition to what they see with Jesus, what he says and what he does. And you have Pharisees in the crowd telling his disciples to rebuke him. And then we took a minute to uh, expound on Jesus' statement that if, this, if the disciples and Jesus were and the people around him were quiet about what was happening, the very stones would cry out. And we we saw that that was maybe less about yeah. stones shouting out in praise and more it being a response to injustice uh, that we see uh, yeah. happen in the Torah with, when God talks about those crying out at the Zedekah that is absent uh, among God's people. Um, and then we moved yeah. on from there to Jesus weeping over the city, uh, and we would think that it would seem more compassionate than we, maybe we've, we're going to see in a later instance. But he he had a whole lot of negative things to say about the coming judgment of Jer- Jerusalem and Israel for their failure to accept him as the Messiah in this critical time. Um, and then we ended yeah. up and ended the episode with Jesus going into the temple, driving people out, overturning the tables of the money changers and again just jesus standing up for injustice that we see even previously with that statement about the stones and wanting his father's house to be a house of prayer not a den of robbers yeah and we're even going to talk about that more because as we mentioned matthew had that happening but mark has it happening later so we'll 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 talk about that yeah, and I loved the. It was sort of some dual imagery. The you know the obvious thing, like when you talked about the stones. Okay, yeah, I'm sure it was crying out in worship. But guess what? There's something underneath that, something behind that, and those were cool. But here, you know, basically we're just getting into the day of a day in the life, and this is Jesus's final week. So maybe as a slight recap, let's remember that. Listen. Let's go back and start on Saturday. Saturday was a Sabbath. And as near as we can tell, what we're seeing in the story is that he spent that in Bethany. And whether, you know, it's explicit or we're just making some sort of assumption, whatever, we're saying that he was with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. It it at least makes sense. It gives you a clear picture of what it might have been like. But then that was followed by Sunday, the first day of the week. And that was, as you talked about, Samuel, the triumphal entry. And again, as you mentioned, Matthew had Jesus actually going in and clearing the temple on that same day, whereas Mark only had him walking in, kind of looking around, sizing up the situation, whatever. Uh, we'll just deal with it when we get to it. It's it, Again, it's that whole story of eyewitness testimony and it not being exactly in tune, and, you know, sometimes that adds to its authenticity. But let's go ahead and read some stuff first. Uh, In Matthew, 
We were continuing in chapter 21. We're looking at verses 18 and 19. And then in Mark, we're in chapter 11. We're looking at verses 12 to 14. I'm going to go ahead and read from Mark. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now, just to point this out, over on the Matthew version, it ends with an even extra little bit, and it says that the fig tree withered at once. Well, now here's another big discrepancy because Mark, he's going to have it withering and and they discover it later. But whatever, we're just going to kind of note the differences and go with it. We, We know the tree withers. We got that part right. So now let's get our head in the game. So we've talked about Saturday. We talked about Sunday. Well, from Mark's perspective, now this is Monday, Monday of that final week. And Jesus and his disciples are heading back to Jerusalem in the temple. Notice again, it's to and from Bethany overnight. It's an important part of the imagery. Now, both accounts tell us that Jesus is hungry. Now, Sammy, I'd like to step back just for a second, maybe be a little silly. Who was he staying with in Bethany, we think? Uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And what do people always bust Martha's chops for? What is she doing? Uh, scurrying about being a hospitable host. Right. And so, wait a second. Jesus gets up in the morning, they start heading for Jerusalem, and he's hungry? Well, where did Martha, the hostess with the mostest, go? I mean, this is when we need her, right? She, she hit the snooze button. <laughs> right. How could he walk out with no breakfast? But now, then again, I mean, just to, to sort of play the opposite side... It actually doesn't say that there's anyone else who's hungry. And so maybe it has nothing to do with Martha and, you know, her, the the house. Maybe this was just like Jesus's routine. Maybe he was out in prayer and he came in and said, come on, guys, let's head for Jerusalem. And so he just skipped breakfast. It's like his own doing or whatever. Okay, we don't know. I don't even know if we really care. I mean, the point is that he's hungry, but I'm just saying What we're going to see, this is like your first introduction to, okay, this little part of the story, it's actually kind of weird. And so we're going to find out more why that is. So Jesus sees this tree and he wants to go for some figs, right? It's a fig tree. What do you think you're going to find on it, Samuel? Uh, Figs. Well, uh, you know, you'd have to guess that, right? (laughs) So now, but here's the thing though. Now, a lot of people look at this and I mean, they have arguments about, well, you know, whose tree was it and, you know, all this kind of thing. Okay, first, uh, let's just be super clear. We don't know. Nobody knows whose tree this was. Uh, We, on this pocket, we're just going to kind of make an assumption that the tree was, I don't know, let's just call it public or something. Matthew's version, it actually includes the phrase that this tree was by the wayside. Well, what does that mean? Eh, We don't really know, but... You know, it's not totally unreasonable to think, oh, well, maybe it was just a wild fig tree. It was just kind of growing out by the road or whatever. Here's what we do know. Here's why I'm kind of trying to stick up for Jesus. He wasn't stealing figs from somebody's tree, if you know what I'm saying. Okay, he's Jesus. He was either without sin or he was not, right? And we've talked about all the weirdness with, you know, the, the disciples were picking heads of grain and this and that. What was the law? Who was breaking the law? Whatever. Look, whatever it was that Jesus was doing, let's just go with he wasn't breaking any law of God. That much we know, okay? But, Samuel, this final week, where are we again on the calendar? Isn't this during Passover? Yeah, during Passover. And then, if we were going to go with, like, seasons of the year, what season of the year are we in for Passover? Oh, no. The Jewish calendar gets me confused sometimes. It's not... Is it during the f- sp- our spring, but their fall? No, it's 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 everybody's spring. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I mean, everybody, you know, let's just say north of the equator, or however that whole thing works, right? <laughs> yeah, it's spring. The, and in fact, remember how they break the festivals up into the spring festivals and the fall festivals? Mm-hmm. This Passover was a spring festival. Now, there's also the thing of the, that Jewish calendar. There's that really weird twist way back toward the beginning of it where it actually gets kind of split in half and twisted backwards or what so maybe you're you know that's confusing for you all of that but here's the thing it's in the spring well figs didn't get ripe until summer mark even tells us it wasn't the season for figs well samuel do you think that jesus didn't know that you would think that he would he's a very cogent individual yeah whether he was like some sort of fig tree farmer or not (laughs) living around Israel, he would know. Of course he knew. So let's at least toss this in there as another possibility. In the spring, you could sometimes find what people would refer to. I don't know if this was like an official name or something popular in the first century, but for us, we're just going to call it the early fig. Well, what does that mean? It means it was like a fig sprout. It wasn't, it wasn't a fully grown in size kind of fig. And so it was, it was early, it was green, it was kind of soft. So, and some people liked those. So you never know, maybe Jesus was hoping for early figs. Okay, not unheard of. Okay, here's another possibility. If it really was a wild fig tree, sometimes figs would remain on the tree. Somebody didn't pick them. And so they would literally like, dry right there on the branches so you'd get a dried fig and it would just be left over from you know call it last year or whatever maybe jesus was hoping to find one of those we don't know that's a modern day fig newton that's true yeah yeah minus that soft cookie out so oh that's good stuff anyway so yeah the point is he goes whatever it was he thought he was going to find he finds nothing nothing and so Samuel, you, I, anybody listening to the podcast, you can easily imagine that moment of disappointment when you're hungry. You think there might be something, but it's not there. But does Jesus seem, you know, just disappointed? Uh, He seems a little bit more animated than disappointment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it seems kind of downright angry. He curses this tree. And of course... I mean, when Jesus curses something, come on, that's for real. I mean, if I cursed a fig tree, chances are the tree's going to survive it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When Jesus does it, this is bad stuff. So on the surface, this is a really strange story. Why is he looking for figs? Why did he curse the tree? What's What's all going on here? And it isn't just that it's a strange story. It's a strange story for the gospels to include i mean they why are they including it it's 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 just odd and then you know just add to it like under the surface how do you take these gospel stories i think most of us are going to look at this and go well i mean in some way or another this had to have actually happened in real life and so the whole thing is just weird and so the 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 thing is it makes jesus look like on one hand, maybe he's not a very good planner. He doesn't take care of himself. He didn't even bother to have breakfast when he's at the house of Martha, Martha, the hostess with the mostess, whatever. It makes him look impulsive. He went to find some fruit on this tree and there wasn't any, and he's misusing his phenomenal cosmic power. It's not really the Jesus that we've been witnessing up to now. It it seems a little out of character. Not to say that he's been perfectly in character at all times, but this is just weird. And then one final thing. Okay, we're talking about Jesus. Why did he have to curse it? I mean, couldn't he just as easily have made it bear fruit? Hmm. I mean, the whole thing is just strange. Why is it included in our gospel? The story... I think it gets used as a lesson coming up soon. And and so what I'm going to do for this episode, hopefully it'll all be within a single episode. I'm going to leave everybody hanging with this story because we're going to talk more about it coming up when there's sort of like the, the finish or the end of the story. For now, I'm going to leave you to just hold on to all of this weirdness. 
And and again, I just want to point out, I know Matthew had the tree withering immediately, but we're going to, for the purposes of the podcast, we're going to go ahead and follow Mark's chronology where they discover it a little bit later. It's actually the next morning. But either way, we, we get the idea. The tree has withered. But for now, we're going to go on other than whatever comments or questions you have, Samuel. I I don't. I'm ready to figure out the cliffhanger. It's, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> e- eating at me. All right. Well, let's use this next section as our walk up to the cliff. No, I'm kidding. We've already been there. Uh, so here we go. What are we looking at? We're now... Uh, In the book of Mark, we're going to continue in chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 15 through 19. And then uh, this is Luke chapter 19, verses 45 through 48. And so uh, what we're going to see here is Mark and Luke are agreeing that Jesus clearing the temple happened a little later than the way Matthew had presented it. So we're going to talk a little more about that now. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and read from Mark just because he's got a little more detail. Here we go. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them. And saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. Okay, once again, a lot of stuff in here. And I know we've already covered it very recently, at least an overview back in Matthew. Now we're going to dump into some more detail. And in fact, man, Samuel, this little section probably sounds as innocent as anything else we've read. It is just filled with the richness. It is chock full, right? And the thing is, you're going to think by the time I get to the end of everything that I want to talk about here, that I've really overdone it. And I just want to say right out at the beginning, you have no idea how much I'm leaving out. Mm. This is so filled, but okay, just let's get going. Mark and, and Luke, they've got Jesus clearing the temple. And I don't know, you might think it actually makes a little more sense here. And I'm what I'm referring to is we just heard the story of him being hungry and he got mad at the tree and all of that. And so, you know, we might look at this and in modern terms, we might say that Jesus is hangry. Samuel, can you define for people what hangry is? Uh, Webster's Dictionary defines it as the combination <laughs> of hungriness and angriness. Yeah, yeah, your hunger actually makes you angry and you you act up, right? And I don't know if you're any way familiar with American culture, we would say, man, it's too bad he couldn't get his hands on a Snickers bar. Am I right? Yeah, his his disciples were saying, Jesus, you're not you when you're hungry. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, the Snickers bar would have been the answer, but he didn't have one. And by the way, how much would a fig or fig paste or something like that, could you imagine that as being a part of the ingredients to your Snickers bar? I think so. I I think so. I'm just saying. Jesus was going (laughs) for the natural solution. But anyway, you know what? I told you this was all going to be long, and I'm making it longer. Joking aside, as we talked about earlier, many times, Samuel, Jesus loved the temple. In fact, what did he consider the temple to be? His father's house. Yeah, his father's house. That is a very endearing and intimate and close kind of of label to put on the temple. And okay, so remember we talked about the original clearing of the temple was back in John 2. And okay, I don't know if I said this when we were talking about it before in Matthew 
you know, there are some people that actually do think that these two incidents, whether whether it's, you know, Matthew yesterday or Mark and Luke today and what we had way back in John 2, they think they're all the same story. Jesus only did this once, okay? And maybe that's true, but okay, that's, that's I mean, that is a humongous discrepancy between John and what we've got going here in terms of time and everything else. So I think it's also understandable that there are people who think it's two different events. And I, okay, it's a little weird that he would do it twice, but I don't know. I, for our purposes, we're just kind of going with the gospel writers and going, look, they've they've inserted a, a huge time difference here, and there's reason enough to think it's two different things. So we're going with it, just so you know. But the, it's it's the same setup. The people have been using the courts of the temple like a market, and and now. To, to help us get a better image of what's going on, this we're talking about the court of the Gentiles, at least most probably. That, that it's it, the way the story is written and some of the some of the details. It makes it makes sense. Now, just to say it again, they were actually these people, the money changers, all the stuff that was going on. They were actually providing, at least in part, a very legitimate and useful service. People traveling into Jerusalem, trying to show up with an animal that had no blemish, one that was was good, allowed to be sacrificed, that was a difficult task. So to be able to go to Jerusalem and buy an animal, that was awesome, right? In fact, even the Torah itself has commands telling people, hey, you know what? sell your stuff back home, take the money to Jerusalem, buy what you need there. So it's really important stuff. But these same people, or maybe not the same people, maybe a slightly different group of people, they were also facilitating something that we might call uh, not so legitimate, the paying of the temple tax. They were having to exchange coins. They needed ones with proper silver amount, all this kind of stuff. It's a complicated story. And you could go hear more about it if you wanted to go back and listen to uh, the Gospels, number 65, but we're not going to rehash it here. So Jesus didn't think that was quite so legitimate, but they were doing things. The point is, they were providing these services. Okay, the problem wasn't the fact that they were providing these services. The problem was that they were providing them in the temple courts. Even though some people might go, yeah, but it was the court of the Gentiles. Doesn't matter. It, what they were do- they were doing it at the expense of the temple, and and I think it's also reasonable to think that for most of the time period that we're talking about, these services were indeed being provided, but they were outside the temple grounds. And the big issue is here that they're they're trying to move it inside on in the temple grounds, like in the court of the Gentiles. So they're killing sort of the point and the usefulness and the sacredness of the temple, if you know what I'm saying. And Samuel, here's another question, just side note. So Jesus goes in, he clears the court, whether it's in John 2, whether it's here, not what, if they're the same or they're different. Serious question. Jesus clears it. How long do you think it remains cleared? That's a really good question that I do not have the answer to. Yeah, well, now, of course we don't have the answer. It's totally an opinion question. You're speculating. But here's the thing. I, I get a little pessimistic at times like this, questions like this. I would bet you he, you know, goes in and uh, like from their perspective, here's this crazy guy chasing them all out. As soon as he walks away and starts teaching wherever he goes somewhere else, I bet you they just moved right back in. I bet it was measured mm-hmm. in more like minutes and hours rather than <laughs> days or months or years. But anyway, there's that. The point is, Jesus didn't like what was going on. And I'm just going to say, he understood that there was such a thing as sacred space. Now, on one hand, it was open to all. And in, in some sense, it was for all. And yet, at the same time, All who entered were expected to meet the standard of that space. And of course, we can't deny part of that standard was, hey, you had to actually be Jewish. There was a place for the Gentiles on the outside, but 
you had to be Jewish, and then, of course, all of the Levitical laws, everything that had to do with that. So, now, I, here's a cool thing, though, Samuel. I, I don't think that we actually uh, talked about this back in John 2 or whatever, but if we did, it's a repeat. It's still a good one. Doesn't matter. So think about the Jewish tradition. Jewish tradition around Passover time has people going through their houses with lamps and feather. They're doing all this work. They're trying to remove all the leaven from their houses. It's a big, big deal. And it's kind of a fun thing for parents and kids and all that kind of stuff. But that's a Passover Jewish tradition. You got to remove all the leaven from your house. Samuel, what does that leaven represent? I believe it represents sin. Exactly. Yeah. And now look what Jesus is doing. Where is he? He's in the temple. And what did we call the temple? His father's house. It's yeah. sacred space. In it, some ways it's like the body itself. Yeah. Jesus is cleansing his father's house from leaven. <gasps> oh, it's like Jesus is doing the Passover tradition, except he's doing it with the temple instead of like, you know, his his mom's house back home or whatever, right? I just think that is such a cool image. And uh, I, honestly, this one, it, it it's just, you know, pet peeve, irritation, whatever. A lot of people look at this moment right here and they come to the conclusion that Jesus is somehow ending the sacrificial system. And I'm just going to say, no, he's not. So just stop it. Uh, he's doing no such thing. He wants the 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 businessmen, the traders, the marketeers, you know, all these. He wants them to quit doing business in the temple. He has no problem with the actual service that they are providing, or at least there's nothing to in the text that actually uh, suggests that he does. And in fact, if you think that he's ending the sacrificial system, boy, are you going to be surprised when Jesus participates in it in just a day or two or three. So it, it just doesn't make any sense. So moving on. Now, here's another interesting point. So what Jesus is doing, clearing the temple, not even let people carry things, whatever. I think this is super interesting. The Pharisees, we always look at them as the bad guy, right? And, you know, American normal Christianity, right? Well, the Pharisees probably weren't bothered by Jesus' behavior at all. In fact, they might have been sort of standing on the sidelines going, yay, Jesus. I mean, hey, we may want to kill you and all, but... Good good on you for this one, pal. Clearing the temple of all these losers, that's great, right? <laughs> because they had some very strict ideas about the temple as well. They wouldn't even allow a person to carry a walking stick or a money purse or whatever through the temple mount. And you're saying, well, I don't understand. What were all those people doing in there? Well, here's the thing. The Pharisees, they weren't actually in charge the Sadducees were. So the Pharisees, uh, what we see Jesus, Jesus doing, he's actually like super in tune with the Pharisee perspective on how we should treat the temple, except Jesus doesn't care who's in charge. He's going and clearing it out anyway, something the Pharisees would not do. So I just think that that also is super cool to see. But you got, he, here's Jesus, and Mark tells us he's not going to allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Perfect alignment, Pharisaic thought. Jesus cares about this sacred space. It's just, it's important to see. Important to see. And Samuel, again, this is all really long. If you feel like you need to jump in, interrupt, get some questions, please do so because it's just so much to talk about before we get to the end of it. Got it. All right, so, so here's another thing. I, I said this before, I'm saying that this is likely occurring in the court of the Gentiles. Now, uh, it, it would be difficult to defend, like, just, here's all of my proof. It's, I'm admitting that it's speculation, but I think it's, it's at least reasonable, and here's why. Herod had been doing this, I mean, if you like fancy temples and all that kind of stuff, Herod had been doing an amazing work with the temple right there in Jerusalem. I mean, it truly was a sight to behold. You can't, 
You can't deny that. But part of his expansion of the temple, he didn't just make the temple nice. He actually expanded it, which was also, I mean, you know, depending on who you are, maybe that's kind of cool. But the court of the Gentiles in its entirety was an expansion of the temple. It wasn't a part of the original boundaries. And that could be key because it could have been that some looked at that and said, hey, you know what? We're not even going to consider this to be part of the sacred space of the temple. It wasn't part of the original boundaries. And so they may have looked at it as different. It was outside, right? And if you have that in mind, well, then it's easy to see why maybe they wouldn't have been bothered or offended by people making it a bit of a market kind of area. Right or wrong, at least you can understand the logic behind it. That, that, that seems reasonable. However, in the midst of this whole circumstance, what does Jesus do? Well, he whips out Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. He lays that on him. And I mean, it would really do you good to go back to Isaiah and read chapter 56, verses 1 through 8 to get, you know, the, the, the full picture of what Isaiah is talking about in that moment. But, you know, here, Mark even phrases it as, you know, I think he's including this as a way of teaching them, instructing them on why it is making even this outer Gentile court, they're making it, you know, they're doing the wrong thing. Here's what he says. Here's how it connects. This section of Isaiah, okay, it's understood by many to refer to the temple, but not just any temple. It's the temple of the Messianic era, the temple of the kingdom era. And and it's important because if you go back and read it, it speaks of all nations worshiping at the temple. It's not just Israel. And this is so important. I mean, if they really are in the court of Gentiles, and if they really did have some idea in their head that that kind of sort of made it okay because it was outside the boundaries, and come on, it's just the Gentiles, Jesus is coming on and going, hey, you guys are seeing this all wrong. The temple, the the, the end goal of the temple is that all nations would be involved in it. So these non-Israelites, they're going to serve God. They're going to keep his Sabbath. They're going to keep his covenant. And they're going to be welcome in these temple courts. In fact, they're even going to offer burnt offerings and sacrifices. And guess what? At that point, at that time, they are going to be accepted. Now, I know It's a podcast and it's audio only and that we recorded in advance and I am not really there while you're listening to this podcast. But I just want you to know, I am imagining your shocked face right now at this moment. (laughs) And you're going to find if you go back and read Isaiah chapter 56 verses 1 through 8, I didn't make any of that up. That's Isaiah talking. And so I'm I'm suggesting that the point of all of this, that Jesus' point in the moment, is that faithful Gentiles, well, they're going to be first-class citizens too. That is a part of the story. And so Jesus is here, right here in the moment. He isn't just protecting God's temple like in the the, the most focused sense. He's actually looking out for the, the the purpose of the temple and the end goal, and he is protecting even the space of the Gentiles. He's protecting their participation even at this point in the story. And again, we're audio only, but if there was some visual component to our podcast, we would definitely insert the mind-blown emoji right here. <laughs> Paul, that's so good. Um, I wanted to jump in really quickly. It's almost as if, and like, definitely correct me if this is too far of a reach, but it's almost as if Jesus is defending 
the construction of the court of the Gentiles that was directed by Herod, uh, f- like for its sake of giving the non covenantal people a space to be able to come near, draw near to God, interact with Him, and what He has set up for the nation of Israel. And I think that the text defends that by uh, in Mark eleven seventeen when He says. Is it not written, my house? Like, and you said it. You've talked about it. My, sh- uh, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? Yeah, I just think that's really cool. That even though Herod, on most accounts, was not a great guy, uh, <laughs> for <Right>. whatever, <laughs> yeah, for for whatever reason, like whether it was for momentary, genuine. Uh, motives or there were subconscious like evil things behind his desire to create this uh, court of the Gentiles. Jesus was affirming it to say like this could be used to bring the nations in and you all the the chosen people are treating it like it doesn't even matter. Yeah. And that's that's not right. Yeah. It's like you're missing the story. Yes, you are central to the story. You are the chosen people. You are God's bride, even. How all those things you want to say, yes, 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 yes. But remember why. It was for the sake of all mankind. And so, yeah, you're right. God, God will use anything. And it goes back to what are some other things we've said? You can't thwart God, right? Uh, and, and, God will use anything, everybody, anytime, anywhere. He is going to accomplish his purposes, and we're just along for the ride. So it's better to Mm. just be on his side. That's all. (laughs) Yeah, good point, Samuel. Good. Using Herod. Okay, so, and and, uh, let's continue, because you brought up the thing about the den of robbers. So Jesus' comment, you have made it a den of robbers, well, that actually seems to allude back to a different place, not Isaiah, but Zechariah. In fact, uh, you know what, Samuel, why don't you go ahead and read it? Zechariah 14, 21. I've, I've clipped just a piece out. And there shall no longer be a traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. Yeah. Now, <laughs> some translations, okay, this is, okay, this is hard on audio. Uh, some translations have the word Canaanite, where Samuel just read the word traitor. And that's T-R-A-D-E-R. It's like a merchant, not a traitor, right? <laughs> so, uh, but, but okay, that's kind of weird. Why would it say Canaanite in some versions and traitor or, or merchant or whatever in other versions? Well, there's an actual translation issue. Apparently, the words are really close, and I don't know, whatever. The point is, if we accept the the trader or merchant kind of translation. Well, this makes a really good indicator that uh, Jesus is in fact the Messiah. I mean, he's alluding to himself. There's no longer going to be a trader or merchant in the house. Jesus is going to bring that about in the messianic kingdom, the messianic temple, right? All of that. Anyway, uh, and if that wasn't enough, it also makes some allusion to Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. Why don't you read that for us, Samuel? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Yeah, and what's cool about that, see, this is more of that dual meaning stuff. In Jeremiah, where this is written, this is a warning about... The destruction of the temple. Well, Samuel, what did Samuel do right in the middle of his triumphal entry? He prophesied what? Uh, About the destruction of the temple. He also said, (laughs) Samuel, what did Samuel say about the triumphal entry? (laughs) Did I? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Sorry, that was Jesus doing the triumphal entry. I do like you, Samuel, and I hold you in high regard, but you're not Jesus. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So Jesus on his way in had prophesied the the destruction of the temple, Jerusalem, the city, all of it. And here he is in the middle of this little bit. He's seemingly making these allusions back. Jeremiah 7, 
uh, it calls them a den of robbers, and it's about the destruction of the temple. This is amazing. Amazing. And so, again, this little section of scripture, it's just rich with stuff, and I'm leaving things out. So, once again, I want to go back and recall a few little bits back from John chapter 2. And again, we're presenting it as if these are definitely two separate incidents, but some think they're one, so whatever. I, I don't think there's any particular spirit spiritual understanding or like big story understanding to be gained by saying that it's a single event versus two or not or whatever. I don't know, but uh, whatever, we're going to continue on doing what we're doing. On one hand, when we go back to John 2, when he makes his statement about the temple, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up, we can definitely think of this temple as Jesus's body. And, you know, of course, for us, in hindsight, we're looking back, we're seeing the obvious allusions to his death and resurrection. But on the other hand, I think that we can think of this temple as the actual temple. Well, how could you do that? Well, I think it makes for an obvious allusion to Messiah's rebuilding of the temple in the Messianic age, when he returns. And this fits with a prophecy in Hosea, chapter 6, verse 2. Samuel, why don't you read that one for us? After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Yeah. Now, why am I seeing a connection here? Well, Jesus says, in three days I will raise it up. In Hosea, he's talking about two days and three days. All right, so there's a connection. Also, if we're looking at Hosea, no one looked at the prophecy of Hosea, at least not after a few days, let's say, (laughs) nobody looked at that and thought that he was talking about literal days, 24-hour periods, that kind of stuff. Why? Because it didn't come to pass yet. And so they also understood that God looked at time differently. And I'm sure everyone is going to quickly in their mind go to, oh yeah, Uh, To God, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Well, Jewish uh, interpreters did the same thing with Hosea's prophecy. They said, oh, two days, three days. Yeah, those are millennium. Each day is a millennium. So this is two or three thousand years. And it wasn't to be taken, you know, super literally, but it was suggesting a very, very long period of time. Well, in the same way, if we go back to John Two, and he says, you know, if you destroy this temple in two or three days, or in three days, I'll raise it up. Well, how did they destroy the temple? By not repenting, by not accepting this Messiah that God had sent in his time, right? All of this stuff. And so Jesus is going to rebuild that messianic temple, and it's going to be two or 3,000 years after it gets destroyed in 70 AD. Do you see how this is all coming together? It's such cool imagery all the way around. And I don't know, whatever, there's that. Any Anything, Samuel, I'm about to wrap up. No, uh, it's just soaking it all in. Yeah, and then when I say wrap up, I just mean this section. We're not going to like end the podcast early or anything. <laughs> Who do you think this is? <laughs> All right, so a couple final points. Uh, we see again that all all of this made the chief priests, the scribes, and the principal men want to kill him all the more. Samuel, which group did I leave out? The Pharisees. Yeah. How interesting that at least in this one moment they're not included because seemingly they were probably thinking along the same lines. They didn't want these people in the temple either. But anyway, uh, let's see. They They would not could not uh, in a boat or on a train nah sorry that's a little dr seuss for you uh they they wouldn't kill him they couldn't kill him because the people were so taken with his teaching they feared the consequences if they did nothing but they feared the consequences even more if they did something so uh, they they were in a tough spot there were many people at this time around they loved Jesus. But these chief priests, these scribes, these principal men, and, you know, some portion of the Pharisees, they were determined to find a way. And just a little side note, last thing we see again at the end, Mark says they traveled back to Bethany. Uh, Yeah, yeah, they went out of the city. 
So you see that imagery again. It's important to see that. So anyway, that's the last we're going to talk about that clearing of the temple stuff, Samuel. Anything more there before we get back to the fig tree? Um, other than I know that you had mentioned earlier in this section about we were speculating, like, how long did it take before they set up everything again? <laughs> right. For, but if you see in verse 18 where it says at the end of it, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Like, I, I was looking up the Greek word for that. Like, oh, yeah. A, a, amazement is another one. Um, I mean, you could take that wording to say that his actions and the imagery that he was evoking got to the heart of some of them. And maybe sure. they didn't. Put, put their tables back up and begin business again. I, I just wanted to bring that up. That Yeah, very possible. Uh, a, astonishment doesn't just mean like shocked and then they resume. Like it, it could, very well could have struck a chord with them. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah, and as I admitted before, I'm kind of pessimistic toward humanity, generally speaking. <laughs> it's probably not right, but <laughs> yeah, it, you're, you, you are perfectly right it, it could have it could have really made a huge difference and he could have been uh immediately fulfilling that prophecy we talked about so yeah very good point anything else uh, this is just kind of for fun but are we to imagine jesus when he's driving these people out and overturning the tables do you think he was like shouting and yelling like yeah. I, I always wonder like did he do it quietly or i mean i, I Rarely do I ever think about Jesus raising his voice, but it's hard for me to think that he did that without having some animation to his words. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Righteous anger. Yeah. Obviously, we'll never know, but uh, if if we're just saying, you know, how do you imagine it, Paul? I'm like, yeah, I can definitely see him just filled with passion and not like screaming like an irrational, you know, <laughs> madman something. But, yeah, I can see him being very loud, very vocal, and, and I, 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 for sure, I see it that way. But maybe not. Maybe he was Joe Cool. I, I don't know. <laughs> All right. It's Jake. It's Jay Cool. Jesus Cool. That's right. <laughs> That's right. All right, so uh, we got this last little bit, and there's really not a lot of time left, so it may feel like I zip, but let's do it anyway. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 21, verses 20 through 22, and Mark chapter 11, verses 20 through uh, 26, uh, and I'm going to read from Mark. It's got more detail, so let's do that. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots, and Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. And now this final verse, 26, it's not in everyone's translation. Uh, it's not a reliable source, whatever. But it doesn't really hurt much of anything. It adds this. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your trespasses. And the reason I, I mean, that could be a really big deal, except that it appears other places. And so it seems to be in line with what we see in the gospel. So I think it's okay, whether it's there or not. So, man, what do we got here? Now, Remember, in Matthew's version, he had this happening yesterday. The, the tree withered immediately. But Mark has us in the next morning. So in, in our week, we're now on Tuesday. And at our house, that would, of course, be followed with porridge today, Gromit. It's Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> 
We just have to say it every time we use the word Tuesday. But anyway, here we go. So we left off with how strange this story was just kind of in itself. But now we have Jesus's response to their astonishment that the tree withered. Okay, which, okay, honestly, this doesn't help much, at least not obviously on the surface. First of all, why were they astonished? Hadn't they seen a lot of stuff? But many, many see in this story a much greater prophetic significance. And what they're going to argue is that this fig tree was a sign. And and it was a miracle that was to teach of the impending doom that's coming on Jerusalem, the temple, etc. It is a prophecy. And so... Okay, we're going to talk about that a bit, and and I just want to say, listen, if you're reading the text and you're going, yeah, but it talked about him being hungry, and it's a tree, and they're doing the stuff, and it went, I mean, why do you have to go off on this crazy prophecy thing? Okay, I'm not saying that you have to. I get it. It reads like it's just telling a story, more like uh, historical, as opposed to, you know, trying to give us some real spiritual insight. And yet, I think there is some value in what people are seeing here. So let me tell you what I mean. The fig tree, in in this scenario, where what Jesus is doing is like this prophetic sign, okay, rather than just normal behavior, the fig tree would represent this generation of Israel. And if you wanted to, you could go to Luke chapter 13, read verses 6 through 9. You'll see he actually tells an outright parable about the barren fig tree, which is Israel, and all of that. So that's the connection here. And now we've mentioned before that the vine and fig tree represent the abundance of the kingdom. Everyone will sit under their own vine and fig tree. We talked about that. We've also talked about how Israel, in the general sense, this generation— Not 100%, but generally, they are not bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. And again, you can go back to another story. This is back in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Uh, I think it was John the Baptist who's talking about, you know, the axe is laid at the root of the tree, and, you know, it's going to be chopped down, thrown into the fire, all that kind of stuff. So it would seem that Jesus' message of hey, repent, because the kingdom is at hand, Uh, at least from this viewpoint, you could say it looks like that message is coming to its end. Jesus is now following in the footsteps of men like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Micah. And why did I pick them out? Because they actually acted out their prophecy. And they did some crazy stuff. I mean, they were like laying on their side for days or cooking food over animal dung or I mean, weird stuff, right? So Jesus is in some way, at least it's suggested that he is acting something out as a form of prophecy. So uh, let's just Let's just connect this to at least a couple of scriptures. Samuel, read for us from Micah uh, chapter 7, verse 1. Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that that my soul desires. Yeah. Now, okay, is this a direct connection? And is, you know, okay, I don't know so much about that, but... It's interesting to see Micah was one of those kind of a, I don't know what to call it, performing prophets or whatever, and he has this mention of the no first ripe fig, and that's exactly the situation that Jesus is dealing with. I don't know, kind of interesting. How about another one? Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 13. Read that, Samuel. When I would gather them, declares the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered. And what I gave them has passed away from them. Yeah. And here you get another reference to the no figs on the tree kind of stuff. And in both of these cases, in like the generally speaking, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Micah, what are they talking about? Well, Israel has been unfaithful. And so they are going to face the consequences of that. And ultimately, that means destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and uh, the exile. So. So you're, you can understand people making this connection. So in this viewpoint, 
this fig tree incident is some sort of prophetic sign, some sort of act, some sort of performance. Okay, what it's saying is that Jesus wasn't just being impulsive. He wasn't just being hangry. He was deliberately prophesying Israel's impending judgment. And again, this isn't Jesus rejecting Israel. He's not rejecting the temple or the Torah or the Levitical system. He's merely speaking of the impending destruction of some of those things because they are going to enter into exile. And we have been in exile from Jesus's day, even unto now. And just to say it again out loud, what is the, Samuel, I'm going to ask it as a question. What's the harshest consequence of Israel's covenant with God from Sinai? Um, isn't it exile? <laughs> exile, yeah, yeah. And a lot of people look and they go, oh, well, you know, Jesus, uh, God has, you know, rejected Israel. You know, they're no longer the people of God or this or that or whatever. All that okay, the covenant at Sinai doesn't say that. The covenant at Sinai says the harshest consequence is exile. And exile, okay, that's a bad thing, but it doesn't mean outright rejection, okay? It's just an important thing to note. Anyway, the point is this generation of Israel, they had missed their opportunity. They were now going to enter into and remain in exile. And I think scripture tells us, and of course we've lived it all this time, they're going to remain in exile until the kingdom, Jesus returns. And 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 so in that sense, we see the kingdom remaining a not yet right we we've talked about that and how thankful we are that there's also that now aspect of the kingdom but anyway there's that now having said all of that okay i'm talking about this is this is a perspective it's a viewpoint that this was a prophetic sign act or whatever it was okay the text doesn't really give us any of that not explicitly and, and and what's interesting is the disciples, even in their retelling of this story, they don't seem to get it at all, okay? They're just thoroughly amazed at what Jesus has done to this tree. But at the same time, Samuel, isn't it weird that the disciples would be so astonished and amazed at what Jesus had done to this tree? I mean, what are some of the things that they've seen? Seen him turn water into wine, literally raise somebody from the dead. More than uh, once. Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 weird that they are this astonished. But anyway, for, for whatever it's worth, in the story, Jesus just, you know, he kind of goes with their astonishment or whatever. And then he turns, and this is also very strange. He turns the instruction to be something regarding faith. He's using the fig tree as some sort of a jumping off point, and he offers three points regarding faith and prayer. And, you know, the real simple summary is, okay, number one, you need to have faith. Okay. Number two, you need to believe that you have received what you've asked for. Okay. And then number three, you need to forgive others. And even in that, those three, you kind of, man, do, do those all really fit together? Well, when he talks about having faith, in the simple sense, we're just talking about, hey, God exists. He hears prayer. He answers prayer. And if I could slide this in as a Paul thing, this isn't always easily identifiable how it is that God is answering the prayer, but it is always for good. Okay. This faith toward God that we should have, it should be like a small child toward a father. When a small child goes to their dad and asks, for something. I mean, he just very naturally and sincerely and completely expects that his dad's going to hear him, he's going to listen, and that he's going to get an answer. Now, does the child think that he's always going to get exactly for what he asks and exactly the way he wants it? No, but he knows that he's going to be heard, he's going to be answered, and he knows that it's, it's his dad, whatever he's, it's going to be for his good. A small child gets that. That's the way that we should have faith toward God and, and believe that we're going to receive what we have asked for. Now, and, and again, this isn't, you know, if, if I believe, uh, how do you even say that? If I believe hard enough <laughs> or whatever, God's going to do what I want. Okay, it's not that kind of belief. 
And and it's also not, you know, a, well, you know, doesn't look like God answered me, so I must not have believed good enough. Or No, it's not that. that it, it's just a simple trust. It's having no doubt that God has heard and is either he will answer or is answering or has answered and it's it's understanding that looking around us at the circumstance around us we can't use that as our source as our judgment of whether or not he has or will answer what things look like are not the proof of whether God is hearing and answering because he is answering for our good and sometimes our minds expect something different than what real good looks like. Anyway, uh, you believe what you've received. And then this final bit about forgiving others, Jesus is just saying that, hey, uh, well, he includes this interesting phrase, whenever you stand praying. And I say that's interesting because I don't know that this was absolutely true in Jesus's day, but there's plenty of reason to believe it was or could have been. But it certainly is a tradition that is carried through to today. It's it, this, whenever you stand praying, sounds like an explicit reference to the Amidah. The Amidah is a standing prayer. It's, a, it's like 18 points or something like this. The Amidah contains within it a request for forgiveness. And as Jesus has done before, he's kind of teaching or reminding his disciples that if they expect God to forgive them, they must forgive first. And so there's definitely this possible connection, or I don't know, I might even say likely connection to the Amidah. And if there is, it's even more instructive because of this. The Amidah is recited three times daily. So in when Jesus is saying, hey, when you ask for forgiveness, you need to forgive first, our forgiveness of others, this is something that must be done daily. And not just daily, even three times a day. Now, I don't know that Jesus is saying, literally, you must do it this way three times a day. He's, it's an indication of how important that it is. It has to become a part of our daily fabric, our daily life. You must be consciously and intentionally forgiving others, let's just say, all day, every day. So anyway, we can take that away from what Jesus is teaching, but this whole little episode with the fig tree Still, I think it just kind of remains quite confusing or challenging or interesting or whatever. And and maybe after all of this little talk, maybe we've shed some light so that it is more clear. I don't know. Maybe we've confused it more. I'm not sure. And I think it's reasonable to think that there's there's probably much more to be gained from this whole little story. But either way, I think in the end, we can at least do Jesus this one service. We should probably let Jesus off the hook for just being hangry. <laughs> I believe we could do that. Yeah. Oh, I know that we're, yeah, I know that we're way past long right now. This won't take but just a second. I, it's just came up as you have been going through this fig tree teaching. Um, I find it interesting, and maybe there's something here, um, this detail of the early season fig that Jesus was going to try to find and not, you know, there's no fruit being born on that tree. In some ways, I'm I'm feeling allusion to the way that Jesus came to Israel for this, you could say, early invitation to accept and usher in the kingdom through yes. his call to repentance and he didn't find it like they didn't yeah. take the call like there was no fruit for this early season of the kingdom to come and then that's what led to the cursing the tree withering yes. um and now we're waiting again for fruit to be born for the kingdom to like fully and ultimately be ushered in so yes um, i that was just an image that came to my mind that i thought might add to the 
the story. Yeah. And and what you are talking about, you are experiencing the exact same thing that that uh I was communicating about look, the text I mean, it it just it doesn't really seem to say this, but there are a lot of people that speculate that this was, you know, a sign, an act, a performance of prophecy. That's exactly what you're seeing, Samuel. It's the same thing that those guys are talking about. So yeah, you are right on. And again, some people may not accept that, but I, I think it's very reasonable. I think yeah. I think it's a good way to make some sense of this fig tree story, because otherwise it just sounds kind of weird, kind of goofy. Sounds figgy. Yeah. <laughs> There's something figgy going on here. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? No. I think we ought to let them go. Admittedly, this was not a great deal of text, but there was just so much to talk about. So sorry for the slightly long episode. Hope it... Uh, Hope it was worth it. <laughs> anyway, we're done. Okie dokie. Oh! Thanks for listening to the Okie Dokie Most podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a rating and a review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. You can find out more information at www.okidokimos.com. Please feel, to gre- feel free to get a hold of us at okidokimos at gmail.com. And until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon.